Welcome to Elbert Christian Church this morning. Do we have any birthdays to celebrate? Do we have any anniversaries to celebrate? If not, we'll continue on with the service. Please stand and sing with us. Yeah, smile. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're just uh, so thankful for this day, day that you have uh, blessed us with. Once again, beautiful sunny morning, and uh, Lord, we just we thank you for the rains for the past week. And uh, yes, some of us got maybe a little more than what we wanted, but uh, Lord, uh, we're just grateful for everything that we have from you. Father, we're thankful for this time that we're able to be here and, uh, and worship freely in this building this morning. And uh, Father, we just pray that our hearts are lifted up, that our ears are open, that we hear what you have to, hear, have to say to us. Father, just be with us through this service and guide and direct us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I don't have too many announcements, but there is one announcement that's coming up really quick, so I need to bring this one to your attention. And it's uh, Thursday. Um, we didn't last year just because of COVID issues and stuff, but this church has been providing... Um, breakfast for the school when they first start up for quite a few years and it's well appreciated and received by the by the school here and um, <clears throat> Joy's been in contact with Kelly and uh, the superintendent there and um, they're excited that we're going to be doing it again so we're going to be doing it again but we need some help <laughs> um, she has a sign-up sheet in the back uh, for uh, um, it says in here like uh, breakfast casseroles, muffins, etc. But um, we're just excited to be a part of that. And if anybody can uh, can do that or help with that, that would be great. Anything else I needed to add to that? Good. Okay. That's really all I need have for announcements. So um, I guess I guess if you want to sit down, what? Oh yeah, director. There is. Why don't you sit down for a second? Because I'm going to do the scripture after this too, and it's it's a little long. Not really, but. 
<clears throat> um, also, there, there is an announcement in here about the directory update, too. We're working on um, um, getting, because uh, we've got new faces and everything, getting, getting everybody in the directory with uh, any new information that you may have, which is whether it's a new phone or a new address or whatever. But um, we do need to get that updated, and we're working on that. So if you can provide any additional information, it would be appreciated so that people can put faces to numbers to whatever else. So. Okay, this morning's scripture reading I'm taking from uh, Isaiah 55, and uh, I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 11. And I had to bring my little computer thing because I'm reading it out of the English Standard Version because it's uh, a little easier to understand than the King James. <clears throat> 55, Isaiah. Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, it shall not return to me empty. Oh, I think I skipped a part there. I lost my turn. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out of from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Please stand and sing with us again as we do a few more songs. You know I've always loved you 
even before there was time. Though you turn away, I tell you still, don't you know I've always loved you? And I always will, don't you know I've always loved you? Even before there was time, though you turn away, I tell you still, don't you know I've always loved you? And I always I have days, lose the fight, try my best, just don't get it right. I walk, talk, I don't walk, miss the moments right before my eyes. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped. Somebody with a hand that I could have held. I just can't see past myself. Lord, help me be more like mercy. Little more like grace. Little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith. Little more like patience little more like peace little more like jesus little less like me there's no denying i have changed because i've been saved you i used to be Even at my best, I must confess, still need help to see the way you see. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped, somebody with a hand that I could have helped. I just can't see past myself, Lord help me be more like mercy little more like grace little more like kindness goodness love and faith little more like patience little more like peace little more like jesus little less like me i want to be the beggar on the street Love my hands and your feet. Freely give what I receive. Lord, help me be. Want to put you first above all else. Love my neighbor as myself. In the moment no one sees. Lord, help me be. Little more like mercy. Little more like grace little more like kindness goodness love and faith little more like patience little more like peace little more like jesus little less like me little more like living everything i preach little more like jesus Love, oh Lord, 
reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness, like the mighty mountain, your justice flows like the ocean side. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my This morning's uh, communion meditation, I'm going back to, to what I read out of Isaiah 55 this morning, especially the first uh, couple, three verses. <clears throat> but I want to pay special attention to verses 2 and 3 out of Isaiah 55. Verse 2 says, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me. And eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Did you notice that in those two verses, the emphasis put on listening? Um, it, it, it tells us twice. Uh, in uh, NIV, it says, listen, listen. In the English Standard, it said, listen diligently to me. And then it went on to say, incline your ear and hear that your soul may live. Did you ever wonder why God gave us two ears and only one mouth? Think about that. I, I, I got to kind of marvel at some of at, at the things that he did give us. We were um, singing this song this morning, and, and I had to write down these words about our eyes, about how we miss the moments right before our eyes. They're there, and we just either ignore it or, or didn't even see it. But it sounds to me like we should listen twice as much as we should talk. We can't understand someone else's needs if we're doing all the talking. At the end of that, it says, Hear that your soul may live. Verse 2 also asks the question, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? What is the best meal you've ever eaten? That's a simple question, but it's not the easiest to answer. Kind of depends on what, uh, what the word best means, doesn't it? What does best mean to you? Does it mean the most expensive or the most satisfying? There's two different answers to that question then, isn't there? What if we asked it this way? What is the best meal you've ever eaten, taking everything into account? Hopefully there's only one possible answer to that. It's the meal you're about to be taking here real soon, the Lord's Supper. Doesn't really seem like much, does it? That little tiny piece of bread and that thimble of juice. 
It's hardly enough to satisfy anyone anywhere in this world. The bread is just bread, not some uniquely crafted loaf with exceptional value. And the juice, well, it's juice. So then, what about the elements themselves? These elements are still the richest of food that you'll find anywhere in this world. Think for a minute about every meal that you've ever eaten. No matter how delicious and exquisite it was, you ate again the next day, didn't you? The benefit of every earthly meal is temporary. It's this fleeting nature that makes every earthly meal meaningless. Much like everything we use to try and find satisfaction in this life meaningless. All this earth's blessings, temporary. If you doubt this, go back and read Ecclesiastes. It'll tell us all about those temporary things in our life. But that's not true of this bread and this cup of communion. These bits of bread and this fruit of the vine come with the promise that they are the body and blood of Christ. Their physical nourishment may be limited, but their spiritual nourishment is eternal. As surely as we eat the bread and drink the cup, so sure may we be that our sins are forgiven. Is there any other meal that can give you that peace, that comfort, that joy, that strength? Does any other meal have such an in internal impact on your life? eternal impact. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Let us pray. Almighty God, uh what we are about to partake of here, we, we know will not nourish us physically. So we come here for spiritual nourishment. And Father, I pray that for each one of us as we take uh, this uh, bread and the cup in our hands, uh, we will pause and remember the body that Jesus offered up, the blood that he shed, that has given us forgiveness and the hope of resurrection and life everlasting with you. So, Father, I pray your blessing on this time and that as we uh, partake here that we would be, in turn, a blessing to you as we remember Christ and his sacrifice. In his name I pray, amen.
Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, it's at this time of the service we remember of what you've provided us. And Lord, we give back to you freely out of joyfulness out of our heart of what you've blessed us with. Lord, even though we pass a plate at this time and, and think about throwing something in, it is so much more than that, Lord. We need to give back to you each and every day and everything that we do, not just at this time. Whether we can give back monetarily at this time or not, Lord, we need to show our love to you and the love that you've given us. Lord, I just ask that uh, as we give this gift, that you bless it and bless the giver. May it be used to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There ain't nothing There ain't nothing that can't be done by me and God Ain't nobody gonna come between me and God One day we'll live together where the angels trod me and God Early in the morning talking it over As we go into our prayer time, um, we had an extensive list of prayers this, this morning in uh, Sunday school, so I know uh, Joy will have those in the church track thing probably by the end of the day, but um, um, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, I'm going to start off by asking you another question. I know I've asked a lot of questions this morning, but I'm going to ask you one more. We talked about listening and hearing. What if God didn't listen to us? This time right now would be pretty futile, wouldn't it? I'm going to read to you out of Psalm 18, the first six verses here, and, um, and then we'll go into our prayer time. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just uh, we're truly thankful that um, that you hear all of our concerns, our praises, and Lord, we do want to praise you above all else, lift you up as God and Savior, and just mighty who can who can do all things. 
Father, it's just a, a blessing to be here on this earth to serve you. And I pray that be our focus in each and every one of our lives, that our daily walk be something that you can be proud of. You can look down on us and smile, knowing and trusting that your servant will do your work. Father, we just, uh, we just lift up all of those who are, who are struggling at this time, whether it be with illness, uh, monetary reasons, um, just all the, all the troubles of this world. We look at all those things, and, and um, we're just grateful that we have you to look to instead because you are bigger than all of those things, and we're thankful for that. Father, as we go into this uh, sermon time, we, just, we pray that the eyes of our hearts are opened up that we see what your word has to tell us, that we hear through Trace's words what you have to speak to us. Father, just be with us and guide and direct us this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You gotta get your own. <laughs> That's just insect to break up. Thank Mick and Cheryl for the donuts. Make some of the warmest fellowship time you can imagine when you got a donut and a hot cup of coffee. You don't even need people, you just need coffee and donuts. Great fellowship there. Anyway, Dale, thank you for doing the prayer time. And I'm a big Third Day fan. Anybody know who Third Day is? It's a Christian band, Christian music group. And two or three of the songs that, we, that uh, Kenny chose this morning are, are Third Day songs, and I particularly like their lead singer, Mac Powell, who wrote a couple of those. Anyway, um, yeah. Good day. Donuts. Music I like. I don't know. Um, one Sunday after church, a little boy walked up to the preacher and handed him a quarter. And the preacher said, what's this about? He said, well, during your sermon, you said you were just a poor preacher. And, and I asked my dad if that was true. And he said it was. <laughs> so here's a quarter. And I've still got that quarter. Ah, see? We've been looking at God's Big Ten, the Ten Commandments, and um, we're on number four today. And if you remember your Sunday school, you'll remember the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall work or labor and do all your work, and the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Sabbath is just a word for set apart. Doesn't mean seventh, although it sounds like our English word seventh a little bit, but that's not the connection. Um, if we decided there was a connection between all the words that sounded alike, we'd be in trouble. I started looking at some of that, and I decided, yeah, it just got too bad too quick to even go there. The word Sabbath literally means to cease from rest. That's the original Hebrew meaning of the word. It was a day that was supposed to be observed on the seventh day of the week, on Saturday. And it's, again, not because of seventh, but it's because God did this. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the Bible tells us that on the seventh day, God finished his work he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he'd done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he'd done in creation. I, I, I think the point in those two verses is that God rested from all of his work. If you see that phrase several times there, it tends to give a point, doesn't it? So regarding the Sabbath day, there's a few things we can safely assume. And then there's going to be some things that we've assumed that aren't quite accurate. 
But regarding the Sabbath, we can discern this much. One, work is necessary and valuable. We rest one day, we work six days. Okay? Also, though, rest is necessary and valuable. We rest one day at least, hopefully. And then the third thing I think we get from this, maybe the most important point, is that a scheduled and planned time devoted to God solely is necessary and valuable to us. Now, the principle behind this is that Sabbath is a day that God intends for us to put aside this fixed planned time of rest and spiritual devotion to him. And over the centuries, this issue of the Sabbath has been debated back and forth from before Jesus' time right up to our present day. In just about every Christian setting, this has been discussed at one time or another, what it means and what we should do. Even in Jesus' day, it had already become a controversial issue. In Matthew 12, the Pharisees start an argument with Jesus. Well, I shouldn't even have to say that. When the Pharisees and Jesus meet, there's always going to be an argument to get started, okay? So the particular argument this time is about Jesus' disciples gathering grain from the fields to make a meal on the Sabbath day. They claim, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. They're going out into the field, and they're picking grain to make a meal, and they shouldn't be doing any of that on the Sabbath day. Does that sound right to you? Well, Jesus didn't think so. You see, the Pharisees had developed a very legalistic, very critical interpretation of the Sabbath that became oppressive. In their law, which they called the Mishnah, there's not going to be a test, so don't think you have to remember any of these funny words. In the Mishnah, they had created of their own mind and own understanding, not of God's, a ridiculous, and I'm, those are my words, a ridiculous list of Sabbath offenses, things that you could and could not do on the Sabbath day. And this was not scripture. This was not divinely inspired. This was stuff they dreamed up and decided to write down and make people and, and, you know, obey and enforce. For instance, you were not allowed to separate two threads on the Sabbath day because that would be work. So if you have a couple of threads that get tangled, you know, if you've got an extension cord that gets tangled, if your shoelaces get tangled, yeah, you, you can't even tie your shoes on the Sabbath even, you know, with some groups today. You cannot write more than two letters of the alphabet on the Sabbath day or that is work. Okay, so if your wife wants to give you a shopping list, she better not do it on the Sabbath day because that would be against the law. Well, not against God's law, but against, you know, their Mishnah, their made-up law. What else could you not do? Oh, you could not tie a knot. All right, for that reason, I wore slip-on shoes today. Okay, so I'm covered, right? Actually, I'm too lazy to tie shoes, and I like slip-ons. I like boots because there's no laces, you know, the cowboy boots. I like these shoes. My brother calls, me, calls them all the old man shoes. That's fine. I am 19 months older than him after all, as if that matters. Um, in the Mishnah, you could not carry anything on your back, okay? So Grandpa... No toting the grandkids around on your back to play games on the Sabbath day because that would be against the law. You see how ridiculous it's going to get really quick? Yeah, and I could have gone on and on and on. And even to this point, there are days, there are times in this country right now where de devout Jewish, you know, people debate whether or not it's okay to flip that electric light switch whether or not it's a violation of the Sabbath. Here's one for you. You can only walk so far away from your property on the Sabbath. Okay? You know what they did to get around that one? If they knew they wanted to go somewhere on the Sabbath day, they just drop an article of their clothing ever so many feet down the road, 
and they weren't walking too far away from their property. I'm not joking. It's real happy. You can't make this up. <laughs> uh, what else? Oh, if you drop something out your window. It was work to walk outside your door, around the corner of the house, to the window, and pick that up and carry it back in the house. That's work. You cannot do that. But if somebody will tie a rope around you and lower you out of the window, and you don't touch the ground and pick that up, and then they bring you back up through the window, that's okay. That's not work. All right? It gets ridiculous. Um... What's another one? I'm skipping a bunch because some of them are just too silly and dumb. Oh, here's one. They, right now, one of the big questions is whether it's okay to wear an artificial limb on the Sabbath day. Yeah, so that's what they're trying to decide right now, if it's okay to wear an artificial limb. God never intended the Sabbath to, be, to make life hard for us. God wanted the Sabbath to be a blessing and not a burden to his people. It, he wanted it to be a day when family and friends could be together. A day of devotion was shared with other believers. But legalism, this critical attitude, had taken something that God intended to be beautiful and a blessing and turned it into something harsh and hateful and a burden. You wonder, how can people get to that point? How, where does it even begin? I'll tell you where it started. It started in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, uh, you know, God told them not to eat of the fruit, right? Well, when the serpent challenged Eve on that, she said, we were told not to eat it. And the instructions that Adam had given her, evidently, was don't even touch it. I claim Adam was the first one to interpret the word of God. Maybe incorrectly. God did not say don't touch it. He said don't eat from it. So right from the beginning, we see this bent within our nature to take what God has said and run with it, even if it's in the wrong direction. There's another problem. It's a little more closer to home. Is the idea of a Christian Sabbath. All right? And this is one you may have even you know, heard tossed around. It's the idea that those who believe that the Christian church adopted the idea of the Sabbath and gradually changed the day from Saturday to Sunday, and now Sunday is the Sabbath day. Well, I say it's a problem with it because there is absolutely nothing in Scripture to suggest such a thing. There's not a Christian Sabbath. It's all... Just the Sabbath, regardless of Jewish, Christian, whatever. It is the Sabbath, and it's on Saturday. Now, Sunday's been a special day for Christians from the beginning. We worship on Sundays. Why? Well, Sunday is the day that Christ rose from the dead. Sunday is the day that the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles when they were all gathered, and then the the 120 gathered in the upper room, and the church was born. It all happened on Sunday. And, and when those early first Christians started worshiping, they started gathering on Sunday evening. So if you really want to be a stickler for tradition, we should probably disband and start getting together at about 6 p.m. in the evening. <laughs> if we want to be historically accurate. But only then, after that happened, did we start calling Sunday the Lord's Day. Before that time, Sunday was Monday, to, you know, how we think of it. Saturday was the Sabbath, and Sunday, the work week started again. But because Christ rose from the dead, because Pentecost happened on Sunday, the church was born on Sunday, the early believers started worshiping on Sunday evening. We adopted Sunday as our traditional day of worship. But the idea that the Sabbath was somehow changed from Saturday to Sunday, that's just not a scriptural position. It's not a historically accurate position. And, and the biggest problem with all of these ideas about what the Sabbath is, the biggest problem is all these extra biblical ideas, as I call them, 
is that they completely miss the point of what God intends the Sabbath to be. Every one of them misses it. That's what happens. Anytime we start to invent for ourselves ways, you know, that, you know, to do things we think God wants us to do, but he didn't actually say do that, it goes off in the wrong direction. So let me repeat what I said a minute ago. The principle behind the Sabbath, according to Scripture, is that God intends for us to devote a planned and scheduled time of rest and devotion to Him. It's a principle that is relevant to all times, all places, and all people. In other words, I believe it's a universal principle and truth that people should follow. And just in case it hasn't already dawned on you, there are some huge benefits to observing a Sabbath. Now, I'm not preaching to you to stop working on Saturday. We'll get to that in a minute. But what I am saying, a day of rest, a Sabbath, can provide rest. It can offer relaxation from stress. It can restore your mind and your body and your spirit. And it can strengthen your connection with God as well as your family and your friends. These are some of the benefits of a day of rest. And when you look at the first four of God's commandments, of God's big ten here, it becomes pretty obvious if you think about it, if you don't just look at them and blow it off and go on, if you think them through, it becomes pretty obvious pretty quick that God gave these things and these commands to protect his relationship with you. Have you thought about it? He says, have no other gods before me in the first one. What does that mean? It means put your relationship with God first. Obviously, that's to protect your relationship with God. Number two, do not make any graven images. Don't have any idols. Worship God as he really is, not how somebody might imagine him to be. You want to know the one true God, not some you know, fictitious idea of what somebody might think he, or, you know, a God would be. But worship God as he really is. Number three, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't misuse God's name. Honor him, not just with your lips, but with your lifestyle. Protects your relationship with God, doesn't it? You know, it's an obvious one. And number four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. In other words, make time for your relationship with God. It's all about protecting your relationship with God. If you have trouble with your relationship with God, you need to get back to these first five because next one, next week's going to be another one like this. So let's talk about for a little bit this morning what it means to keep the Sabbath holy. The first thing we need to realize is that time is a gift of God. All right? Our time is really God's time. It belongs to him. We have submitted ourselves unconditionally and unlimitedly to God. And everything that we have is his, including the time, because he's the one that gave it to us and created it. So... Time is a gift, and we have to be faithful stewards of that time. The Bible reminds us. So Psalm 90, verse 12 says, Teach us to remember our days correctly so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. There's a connection between remembering time, things, and, 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 and wisdom. Colossians 4, 5, Paul encourages us to make the most of every opportunity. All right? Don't let them pass you by. When we talk about stewardship, we usually mean money, or we're talking about abilities, or we're talking about talents, and all these things, though, there's a difference between all these things and time. Your, 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 your money and your abilities and your talents and whatever else, that's replaceable. All right? If you, you, know, if you run out of money, you can go make some more, right? Hopefully. <laughs> And if you have, you know, lack of ability, you can learn a skill, you know, and a talent. Same way, you can develop a talent beyond what you have. All these things are replaceable or improvable. You, but one thing you cannot do is replace your time. You can't, you can't go back and get more of it. Once that minute is gone, it's gone forever. Once that time is, is not replaceable. 
And it dishonors God when we let our daily schedule become so frenzied and so chaotic that we allow a lack of time because we haven't planned it out to separate us from God. I would have gone to church this week, but I ran out of time. Nobody ever says, I didn't go to church because I ran out of money. I didn't go to church because I didn't have enough talent or, or, or skills. I, I, we don't say that. We say I ran out of time. Nobody says, well, I failed in my marriage because, you know, I didn't have skill. I don't know. Maybe it happens. I don't know. I failed in my marriage because, I, I, you know, I, I ran out of money. <laughs> I've heard of that one, but I don't know that I believe it. <laughs> but a lot of times a marriage fails because it didn't get the time it needed. See, we're talking about something that's not replaceable. How many relationships have been ruined because they weren't given the right amount or the proper amount or even just quality time that they needed? Honoring God means being a good steward of the time that he's allowed us. And that starts by living a well-ordered life which is kind of preaching to me because, you know, especially when I was younger, I kind of enjoyed flying by the seat of my pants and just seeing what was going to happen next, you know. But if you let that continue, you, relationships start to suffer because I discovered you've got to make a conscious effort to set aside time for God, for fellowship with God's people. You've got to make a point to set aside time with your spouse, with your children. You've got to do this, and it's got to be intentional or it tends just not to happen. So how do you do this? How do you do this well-ordered life thing? I'm no expert, but I'll give you four things that I think are important to keep in mind. Spend time with God every day. Worship Him every day. Pray to Him every day. Read His Word every day. Some of you have got a pretty long commute to work. Who's got an hour-long commute to work every day? Is it longer than an hour? No? Anybody got a longer one than an hour? Okay. I remember when I had to drive a long way to work, it was a time of worship and prayer on the way to work. You know? I'd put in the Christian music or something, uh, or, or I'd just turn off the music after a minute or after a little bit, and i just... All of a sudden, God and I would start having conversations. I didn't know anybody passing by thought I was schizophrenic or, you know, or some other problem. The, 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 well, today it's not so bad because they could just assume I'm talking on a wireless phone. <laughs> you can spend time with God on your commute to work. You can listen to Mark and I talked about it. Mark listens to Scripture, don't you? Because, and yeah, how many of you, like, Christy likes listening to books. Exactly. Because somehow reading, it just, that's what I do to put myself to sleep in the evening. I read for 30, 40 minutes and get tired and doze off. So I'm very excited when somebody says I'm listening because that doesn't seem to do the same thing to them. So you could do something. You can do some of these things in some ways. So get creative and spend time every day with God. Secondly, give priority to your family. Don't let a busy life crowd out your wife, your husband, your children. Nobody goes into a marriage intending to fail, all right? In fact, I heard something really, really funny yesterday from this comedian. He, he's, he, he was doing analysis of it. He said, he said one of the statistics he ran across in marriage is that 44% of them end in divorce. And he said, well, I had to see the other side of that. That means 56% of marriages end in death. Yeah, death is better. <laughs> death is definitely better. If we don't consciously set aside time for our husbands and for our wives, it's going to create problems, to put it mildly. How do you get to know somebody? How do you get to understand somebody? How do you learn to love somebody if you never spend any time with them? It just doesn't add up, does it? So, give priority to your family. Third, cultivate friendships. Make time for doing things with other people. Don't spend so much time trying to build your career or build a business that you fail to build meaningful relationships. 
And then number four, take care of yourself. I'm having to learn this one too. The Bible says your body is a temple of, a holy, of the Holy Spirit. Set aside time for rest, for exercise. If you have trouble, time, doing, you know, time for exercise. Or if you're like me, you just, I don't know, there's just something wrong about the word exercise with me anymore. You know, find something to stay active. And, and if you do, tell me what that is so maybe I could figure it out. Um, you know, eat right. And I'm, I'm, I'm averse to any word that starts with the word, you know, the letters D-I-E. You know, I just don't, even if you end it with a T, I just don't care. Uh, so these are things I know I need to do, but I want to also encourage you to do it. And maybe your good example will help me. To be a good steward of our time means making time for God, for friends, for family, for recreation, for rest, for worship, for Christian service, for fellowship. And I could go on. And, and, and overriding all of this is, is Paul's exhortation to us. 1 Corinthians 10.31, the most troubled church in the New Testament, except maybe a couple of churches that he speaks to in Revelation 2 and 3. But the Corinthian church was, man, they didn't have its problems. But he told them this. He said, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. Lord, I'm jogging for your glory. <laughs> Lord, I'm passing up on that donut for your glory. <laughs> Why? How can it be? Well, Lord, if I do this, my body will be a better temple. So bless it, Lord, because I'm trying and I can't do it on my own. I need your help and I need the help of my brothers and sisters. So we honor God by being good stewards of our time. The second thing we learn, not only is time a gift from God, but time needs to be balanced. There needs to be a time for work, but there also needs to be a time for rest. And, and, and on the work side, God intended for us to accomplish things with our lives. Even before Adam sinned, God gave him work to do. He hadn't eaten the fruit yet, and God wanted to put him in the garden to care for the garden. You know, one of our jobs here is to take care of this earth. And I'm not talking being green, okay? It's not what I'm going at. What I'm saying at is, is this old world we live in is a lot better place when we manage it. That's the point, all right? And it's not this, you know, you know, let nature take its course thing. That's not what God said to do. God said to manage this earth. You rule over this earth. Everybody does better when we manage this earth. Every creature does better when we manage this earth. And when we refuse to manage it, things get out of control. Wildfires get out of control. I could just go, I, no, I'm not going to get off on that today. It gets too political too quick. But I will say this, that the world's a better place when we manage it than when we leave it alone. Genesis 2 verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And even after he sinned and, and was sent from the garden, he, he was, now he had to do it in order to survive. But he still had to do it. And Paul, bless his heart, just set it in black and white and put it down where the rubber meets the road. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he said this, If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Amen. You can't get any more plain than that. So, we have to work. Part of your life is intended, God intended you to use your body and mind and all you have to work. But there's also a time for rest. Doesn't have to be 50-50. You know, one to seven ratio is probably fine for most of us. Work is a good thing, but it's got to be balanced. Our bodies and minds were not designed for constant exertion, constant tense, te tension and stress. And, and in fact, all of us have heard the phrase workaholic. And more than one of us in here is guilty of being a workaholic. A workaholic isn't just a person who puts in long hours. You don't have to be a workaholic to put in long hours. There's some jobs that take long hours. Those cows don't care what time of day or what holiday it is, do they, Charlie? 
No, not at all. It takes long hours, and that's the nature of the job. And you can work cows and be a rancher and, and, and not be a workaholic. Doesn't mean you're not working long hours and working hard. A workaholic is a person who is so caught up in what they do that they don't know who they are and nobody else knows who or what they are apart from that job anymore. A workaholic is the guy that gets to the end of his life and retires and has zero to do with his life and just, you've seen it. These guys, you know, they pass away in six months because they've lost their purpose in life after they quit their job. They were a workaholic. It wasn't rewarding enough to spend time with the grandkids after retirement. It wasn't enough just to know that now they could devote a lot of time to their wife and to that relationship that, you know, and maybe take her on that trip that he's promised forever. It wasn't enough. He's not working now, and he just kind of has no purpose. That's a workaholic. It's a person who has no identity apart from the work that they perform. And it's really sad because what I'm discovering as I start to get a little bit less young <laughs> is I cannot work like I used to. And it's driving me up the wall. I see some of you folks that are a little healthier than me and you can stand the heat and you can stand the, the work and everything else and I'm just struggling to keep up. And it I better not define myself by what I can do because I just can't do that much. I got a revelation this past week. Somebody was, one of my college friends, he's a president of a Bible institute in Zagreb over across the other side of the world. He's talking about Acts being the infant church and how effective and how impactful this infant church was in their community and and there and he's right the first generation church made a bigger impact on the world than any generation since and yet some scholars will say well we can't we can't follow the example of the first generation church because that's the infant church and we're not infants anymore we're a mature church in the world's eyes, maturity is self-sufficiency, it's independence, it's, you know, all these things. That is not the spiritual definition of maturity. The spiritual definition of maturity is dependence on God and dependence on the Holy Spirit. I think it's what Jesus was hitting at whenever he talked about having a childlike faith and being fully dependent upon the Spirit of God and not upon your own understanding and, and you know, oh, but I've walked with the Lord so long and, I'm, and I know so many scriptures now and, and I've been there and done that so long now, I think I can listen to my own counsel. If I ever decide, if I, if I ever talk that way around you guys, you guys call me out real quick because spiritual maturity is not that. Spiritual maturity is an utter dependence upon the Holy Spirit and its guiding in your life, not upon your independence and your wisdom and all whatever quality you think makes you mature. It's not, that may be the way the world thinks of maturity, but that's not Christian spiritual maturity. It's a reliance on the Holy Spirit. And the more mature you are, the more dependent you will become on the Holy Spirit. Independence is not a goal in the Christian life. So, where was I? I totally got off on something. Anyway, you've been working hard. You've been working long hours. You've been working, you know, for days and days and days on end. And it's time for a day of rest to recharge yourself. In fact, here's the deal. If you will use that day of rest to connect with God, worship Him and pray, He will restore you. Because he's promised to. So there has to be a time for worship in a Christian's life. It can happen in all kinds of settings. I've already mentioned some. Some are public settings, like what we do here on Sunday morning. Some are private settings, like at home and, you know, or in the car when you're commuting. But there is a time to devote all of your attention and be alone with God. Like, think of it this way. If time is a gift of God, then we've got to be serious about setting aside some of it for him. And also there must be a time for fellowship. 
Um, to that point, there's no such thing as the lone Christian. Back in the 70s, there's this B, C, or D, or whatever lowest grade they can give a movie. This movie had it. But, but it's a Christian movie. It's called The Lone Christian. You know? Who was that masked man? He was a lone Christian. And this guy thought he could just go about and be a Christian all by himself. I don't need the church. Don't need to talk to anybody. Don't need any fellowship. Just me and I'm following God. In fact, really, he didn't even need God. That's what I call being a, oh, being a contractor for God. It's where you tell God, Lord, sit back. I got this. You're paying for it, but I'll get it done for you. And you're just a contractor. That's not what we're called to be. We're called to be servants of God. In fact, the word's even stronger than servant. It's the word slave, but that's not a politically correct term. But that's pretty much the, the idea behind it. We are totally submissive to God and his will, and we do everything that he says and nothing else. You know, um, He says Christians should meet together. A real Christian feels a need and an obligation to interact with his brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not neglect meeting together as has become the habit of some. So work, rest, worship, these are the elements of a balanced life. Have you ever heard someone say, Well, it's my life and I'll do what I want with it? Well, it's not the way we are in Christ. As a Christian, we say, I know my time is not my own. It's a gift from God. I know that once I lose it, I can't get it back. I use and I must intentionally use my time to have the right balance of work, rest, worship, and fellowship. Because it's not my life. It's God's paid for through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And I belong to him. Third thing we learn, if you're keeping notes, taking notes, it's the third point in the outline. Time doesn't last. There's a limited number of hours in a day, limited number of days in a week, limited number of weeks in a month, months in a year, and a limited number of years in your life. Time is running out. Each day brings us closer to the end of time and to the return of Christ. And if he does not return within your lifetime, each day brings you closer to the day when your life is over and you will meet him in heaven. Jesus said this in Matthew 24 about his coming. He said, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. That's an amazing statement. I could spend a lot of time on that, totally unconnected to what we're talking about today. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Amen. The point's this. Use the time that you have left to prepare yourself for our Lord's return. Because none of us wants to be left behind. So my question, my challenge this morning is how are you using the, God, the time God's given you? Is your life balanced and ordered? Is it confused or chaotic? Are you prepared or not for God to return? And what are you going to do? The challenge I want to give you today is this. Make a commitment within yourself. Starting this week, I will honor God with my time by, and you fill in the blank. And it could be a lot of things. Spending time in his word. Devotion, praying, volunteer at church, leading family devotions. I don't know. It could be a lot of things. But fill in the blank. I will honor God with my time by and fill in the blank. Can you do that? You just, you know, there's no test. There's no, you know, I'm not going to. Now, if you have something wonderful and amazing to report after doing this, that's great. I had a doctor friend of mine. He decided he was going to start tithing. I will honor God by tithing. And he started doing that. And as the first year ever finished in the black. So it was a great story when he shared that. So if you have a great story, we want to hear. 
But if you have the opportunity or if you have the conviction, tell yourself, I'm going to honor God with my time starting now by. And if you need some encouragement, tell me or tell one of your, tell your spouse, tell your kids, tell your parents, whatever. They'll help you. <laughs> Boy, will my wife help you. <laughs> yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for giving us your word, for giving us our, these instructions. And Lord, forgive us for those times when we think that your leadership in our lives, or that, your, that your instructions and commands hem us in and, and limit our options. Father, the truth is they free us and create more options. They create a more rewarding life. So Father, forgive, forgive us when we're such small-minded. Help us to see things the way you see them. Father, help us to enjoy the blessings, the blessings of hard work and the rewards of that. Father, help us enjoy the command to take a day of rest and devotion, to spend time focused on you. Lord, you are the source of life. You can regenerate our soul and our mind, our bodies, our spirits. Lord, the closer to you we are, the, the, the more life we have. So, for, Father, forgive us when we think these commands limit us in such, such silly ways that, that and Lord, help us to see the truth. But you want us to be free. You want us to, 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 to learn to love you, to learn to love our families and friends, that your intended purpose and, and the way this world's supposed to function is so much different. And if we would just follow you and trust you, it would be so good. So, Father, I ask you to help us do this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, my God, my King. Love endures forever, for you are good. 